Resident Evil as a franchise has grown exponentially. From isolated survival horror to fights in volcanoes to tall vampire ladies, Resident Evil is a series that encompasses all types of genres and settings as a result of rabid experimentation. And after the huge success of Resident Evil 4 that changed the very tone and gameplay style Resident Evil was known for, the series entered a new age of experiments. And this was especially the case in 2007, where RE fans were not only getting a well shooter entry in the form of Umbrella Chronicles, but also a new addition to the Paul W.S. Anderson Resident Evil films, Resident Evil Extinction. And as they would later find out, it would take the series to unfamiliar territory. Just like the original film in Apocalypse, I absolutely despised Resident Evil Extinction on my first watch, and I recall labeling it as the worst movie I've ever watched. And yet, just like the original film in Apocalypse, I had a way more enjoyable experience of Extinction on my rewatch. And suffice to say, it is far from the worst movie I've ever seen. In fact, despite its glaring issues, I found it to be an enjoyable watch in spite of itself. But what do I now see in Extinction that I didn't back on my initial watch? And is this film for everyone? Well, let's find out as we discuss... After the whopping $129 million box office pull of the last film, Resident Evil Apocalypse, you best bet another sequel in this highly successful series was inevitable. Paul Anderson approached the studio, eager to work on a third film that was planned to be titled Resident Evil Afterlife, that, along with a fourth planned entry, were greenlit. Being a huge fan of Russell McKayley's work, especially of how he shoots his films, Paul Anderson chose him to direct this time around. Instead of adapting elements of the games like the last two titles, Anderson wanted to go in a much different direction of the third movie, and took inspiration from films like Mad Max and other post-apocalyptic western stories to tell an original narrative easier for broader audiences to understand, while simultaneously offering enough fan service for people who've played the games to be satisfied. It may or may not have failed to deliver on that last part. As far as I can tell, Resident Evil Afterlife, which was going to be renamed Resident Evil Extinction, had a very smooth development with surprisingly very few rewrites and script changes. Though, there do exist a few rumors and leaks that suggest a few things that were revised that we'll touch on later. For now, let's just talk about the jarring jump in premise from the last two films. Resident Evil 2002 followed a group of Umbrella agents infiltrating an underground facility overrun of zombies. Resident Evil Apocalypse adapted the main story of RE3 by putting an original spin on it. So, what direction did Extinction go in? Well, we're at the end of the world. Yep, despite the Raccoon City outbreak seemingly being contained by being blown to shit in the last movie, just like the games, it apparently wasn't, and the T-Virus leaked and affected the entire world. If that's not the biggest what the fuck moment right there, apparently the T-Virus also somehow dried up all of the rivers and lakes, making the entire world essentially one big desert. Wow, there's a lot to say here. Okay, one, there's no shot the T-Virus leaked out of Raccoon City. Every single zombie and B.O.W. in it was nuked, so how in the world did it get out? Second, I don't know how a viral agent that turns people into zombies dries up entire rivers and lakes. And third, this is just such a jarring switch in direction. The ending to the last film was batshit insane, but it never alluded to the end of the world, and this is obviously far from anything we've seen in the games. I think Paul Anderson didn't have a good grasp on where he wanted his sequel to go up until last minute when he decided he wanted this to be a post-apocalyptic adventure. But hear me out, even with how nonsensical this direction is, I'm kinda all for it. Hear me out, these last two films have in no way tried to hide the fact they're dumb zombie flicks do and do. So Paul Anderson's just throwing stuff at the wall and drastically switching course to make the movie he wants perfectly fits with the mindless fun this series is. So screw it. If a post-apocalyptic film is the way we're going, then let's have fun with it. And I think Anderson did just that, with the first example being the amazing scenery present throughout the film. While T-Virus drying up lakes and rivers doesn't make a lick of sense, the Mad Max-like setting is executed perfectly. You really get the sense this is the end of the world, especially when you see entire towns half buried in sand. And there are some cool ideas that are a result of this premise, such as Claire Redfield leading a convoy of survivors to this post-apocalyptic wasteland, and Umbrella being set up in different underground facilities with a personal military at their disposal. This post-apocalyptic setting is great if you can get behind it in the first place. And as you've probably guessed, Extinction carries over the fast-paced action seen in the last two movies, except this time around, it's 10 times better for two reasons. One, there's not a lot of action scenes in the movie. This sounds like a con, but no, it makes the action we do see in the movie all the more intense and actually feel necessary. Second, Russell McCauley's camera work is fantastic. I don't get what it is about the way he shoots, but when there's a hectic scene happening, he fully captures the intensity of it without making a million cuts like the previous films. If I had to pick a favorite action scene, it'd have to be the Las Vegas attack. There's nothing complicated about it, it's just a group of survivors desperately fending off against the undead. What more do you want? 
But this is still Resident Evil, so we're bound to get a handful of B.O.W.s present in the movie. And the most obvious of which are zombies. But not just ordinary zombies. No, as a result of trying to domesticate the undead and take away the aggressive impulses of Alice's blood, Dr. Isaac has created Super Undead. Regular zombies have a significant increase in intelligence and are much faster and stronger. I think this is a really sick idea whenever zombie films play around with the idea of giving zombies back their intelligence, and not only is it cool here, but it's a cool way of introducing sprinting zombies instead of the shambling ones from the past movies. I know most zombie fans prefer slow moving zombies, but I'm personally a fan of runners since I find them scarier, and I commend Anderson for not retconning this he-virus and introducing a new breed of undead. Also making an appearance are zombie dogs. Infected dogs of the T-Virus make a brief appearance. And yeah, the makeup is great and a pair of crazy survivors using them as a fighting pair for their amusement is a neat way to utilize them. Also making an appearance from the games are the crows. I know, I know, we have Lickers, Hunters, Ivy. Who in the world would prefer the crows who played a minor role in each of the games they made an appearance in? Well, surprisingly, the crows might just be the most terrifying creatures to appear in the film. And that's because these motherfuckers hunt in packs. In one of the most tense scenes in the entire series, Claire's convoy is attacked by a giant pack of infected crows, and it's just well-directed all around. And lastly, we have a freaking tyrant in the form of a mutated Dr. Isaac. Okay, so he may not actually be a tyrant, but I'm pretty sure that's what he's supposed to be. Two fans, at least. After Isaac is bit by an enhanced zombie, he injects himself with the antivirus, but that of the T-Virus variant containing Alice's blood mutates him rapidly into a tyrant-like monster. I'm surprised it took us this long to see a main villain have an uncontrollable mutation since that's practically the fate of every human RE antagonist, but nonetheless, it's still awesome to see here. And the final fight between him and Alice is sick, ending with a nice laser hallway kill. Oh yeah, Alice. We should talk about her. Mila Jovovich comes back once again to reprise her role as the series heroine, and she's just as badass as previous entries. After being excessively experimented on in the last two movies, Alice has evolved both mentally and physically, now having the telekinesis we saw her have in Apocalypse and is still a loner who's isolated from the rest of humanity. One thing I appreciate is while Alice has her telekinesis powers, her usage of it is pretty limited, meaning it can provide a cool spectacle, but it doesn't make her feel like a superhero. And Mila Jovovich does a great job as always. I don't know what else I can say about Alice, her character is a direct continuation of the person we saw in Apocalypse, and it's nice seeing her finally warm up and get attached to the survivors of Claire's convoy. It reminds her and the audience that she's still human. Another main character who's a newcomer, sort of, is Claire Redfield, a major protagonist from the games. Originally, Jill Valentine from Apocalypse was going to have Claire's role in the movie, but the actress, Sienna Golary, had made commitments to star in another film, so instead of recasting her, the character was swapped out for Claire Redfield, which I think was a good decision. Though this movie would have majorly benefited from Jill being the one leading the convoy along with the other characters from Apocalypse, so it's a shame Sienna could have reprised her role. Still, Claire Redfield was a great choice, and Ali Lauder succeeds in bringing the characters to life. In the games, Claire Redfield is a very badass, witty character capable of thinking on her feet and surviving crazy odds. Here, Claire is the exact same, keeping her wit and skills on the field. I do find it interesting that they chose Claire to be the leader of the convoy, since in the games, Claire is pretty young and has really demonstrated a lot of leadership skills, if you don't count her guardian dynamic of Sherry in the second game. So it's cool to see a depiction of the character bearing a lot more responsibilities and playing a vital role to our character's survival. Like I mentioned earlier, Carl has returned, and he's once again played by Odette Fur. In Apocalypse, I felt Carlos was a blank slate and didn't have much personality, unlike his game counterpart. Here, while I wish there would be just a little bit more to his character, this is a definite improvement. His buddy-buddy relationship with LJ and lieutenant-like position with Claire makes him much more memorable, and him being the closest person to Alice after all they went through in Raccoon City and afterward is pretty sweet. However, after he's bit during the Las Vegas attack, he probably has the most badass death I've ever seen. When a group need to infiltrate Umbrella's North American facility to gain access to a helicopter, he drives through a horde of zombies on a suicide mission and blows him and his running up dead up with explosives as he has the smoke. If that isn't the death of a Sigma male, I don't know what is. Also returning is the undisputed best character in Apocalypse, LJ, once again played by comedian Mike Epps. LJ was a blast in the last movie, being a random lovable asshole the group picks up and being a pretty strong comedic relief. Here, he's not as comedic, but for good reason. Not only has it been a while since Raccoon City and the characters had time to mature and get attached to the others, but super early on in the film, he gets bit. So throughout the entire first half of the movie, you're watching as he slowly succumbs to the T-Virus before his inevitable turn. I always wondered why LJ keeps his bite a secret from the group and puts them all in danger. That was until I realized the brilliance of the subplot. It's a direct callback to Apocalypse when Carlos, Alice, and Angie were infected and never told him, making him comedically frustrated. Now realizing those scenes were not obviously planned to be so, it's huge foreshadowing for his death is pretty sick. 
I also love how apparently Mike Epps knew his character was fucked after hearing this in a fourth movie get greenlit, since black people always die in horror movies, especially in the 90s and 2000s. Next is the central antagonist of the film, Dr. Isaac, played by Elaine Glenn, who you may recognize as Jorah Mormont from Game of Thrones. Dr. Isaac was set up in Apocalypse's bizarre ending scene to be the next main villain, and sure enough, here he is. Isaac is an Umbrella researcher tasked with domesticating the undead to provide Umbrella for labor force, but gets sidetracked when he locates his more passionate project, Alice, and employs everything in his power to capture her and secure a sample of her blood. I mentioned earlier how the super zombies derive from exposure to Alice's blood, but the blood actually came from genetically engineered defective clones trying to replicate the real Alice. I can't say for sure, but I swear inspiration was taken from William Birkin, the antagonist of RE2, to create this character due to their glaring similarities. They're both proud scientists obsessed with their work, they're both taken for granted and neglected by Umbrella's higher-ups, and they both inject themselves with an experimental serum of desperation to stay alive that results in a rapid mutation. Hell, they even look the same. What makes Dr. Isaac stand out is his cruelty, endangering the lives of his expendable employees, and of course cloning dozens of Alice's just to have them all die repeatedly over and over again. If I haven't made it obvious yet, I really like Dr. Isaac as a villain, and he's without a doubt the best antagonist in these movies so far. That wraps it up for the main characters, but a few additional ones that I should mention start with Albert Wesker, played by Jason O'Mara. Yep, this Albert Wesker, the character who's been a major antagonist of the Resident Evil series since the very first game in 1996. Here, Wesker is much like the one from the game, with the exception of his superhuman abilities. He's a calm, cold-hearted figurehead in the Umbrella Corporation who's looking for ways for Umbrella to survive, and even increase in power of the added challenge of an apocalypse. While he never had a powerful position within Umbrella and instead went behind their backs and aligned himself with the organization and the games, this is a different universe and the essence of the character is very intact. There's also those a part of Claire's convoy like Betty, Mikey, and Chase who fun fact is played by Lyndon Ashby who portrayed Johnny Cage in Anderson's first Mortal Kombat film. This attempt to make these characters memorable with standout personalities, but this amounts to the fact that they're all here to die, with the majority of them losing their lives in a Las Vegas attack. However, one character does stand out from the rest, and that's Kmart, played by Spencer Locke. I'm not even kidding, the actual character is forgettable, but her name, Kmart, isn't. Why is that her name? Because apparently Claire and her convoy found her at a Kmart, and she didn't like her last name, so that's just what her name is now. You cannot, in good faith, tell me the goofiness of these movies aren't intentional. So yeah, while the side characters are pretty forgettable, standouts like Alice, Carlos, Claire, Dr. Isaac, and LJ, make for a pretty good cast of characters and who are all portrayed nicely. In conclusion, Resident Evil Extinction is yet another Resident Evil film I was wrong about. Sure, this film doesn't borrow a lot from the source material and makes no attempt to draw in hardcore fans, but that's okay. I don't care what anyone says, this movie is as much Resident Evil as the 1996 masterpiece that started it all. And that's because like I said in the video's opening, in 2007, this franchise was going in an all new direction as a result of excessive experimentation. It simply evolved. And so did the Anderson movies. Resident Evil Extinction goes in an all new direction and has a set of fun characters, great sequences, and enough things borrowed from the source material to make me happy at least. But it's not all perfect. The side characters are forgettable, the film is a little cheesy at times, and while the pacing is good, some of its slower scenes might make a direct rewatch less enjoyable. I also don't think it's as fun as Apocalypse or as suspenseful as the original film. Still, it's a good film in its own right, and you can definitely have a fun time with it. Anyways, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. If you have, then please like, subscribe, and as always, I will see you guys next time. Peace out.